Welcome to Good Games Spawn Point, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Barger. And I am Darren. Today on the show, we bring love back to the galaxy with lovers in a dangerous space time. Plus, we burn some rubber, taste the dust, and push the line in four to six. <laughs> All right, all right, guys. I think it's time for another one of your devilish challenges, Darren. Oh, affirmative hex. Stretch those cranial muscles, spawnlings. It's time for Darren's challenge. Today, I'm asking you this. Which classic Nintendo game just recently celebrated its 30th anniversary? Answer at the end of the show. 30, 30. Oh, that would mean it was released in 1985. See, year I was born. <laughs> I think I might know what it is. <gasps> but now it's time for the news with Goose. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Goose here with all the Spawn Point news. The long-running contest to hold the highest score in the arcade classic Donkey Kong saw the world record score topple twice in the space of just six hours. During the recent Donkey Kong Online Open event, Wes Copeland managed to score an impressive 1,170,500 points, beating out the former champion Robbie Lakeman's score by just over 12,000 points. However, the record did not stand long as Lakeman was also competing in the event. He managed to quickly regain his crown as King of Kong after beating Copeland's new high score by 16,000 points. Copeland did, however, retain one record, becoming the first player to ever score more than 1.1 million points on their first life. The research firm NPD Group has recently released the results of their Kids and Gaming 2015 report, revealing some interesting data on where spawnlings aged between 2 to 17 are playing. The report found that mobile devices are now the most used gaming device among children with 63% playing games on them. This compared to only 45% using a home computer, which is 22% less than it was two years ago. And the use of consoles also saw a small decrease. And that's all for this week. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Goose. Guys, I think any game where you have a pet cat that runs around shooting lasers is probably a pretty good game. <laughs> you had me at lasers, Barjo. <laughs> Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time is an action space platformer featuring both a frantic single player mode and a frantic multiplayer co op mode. Your mission is to bring love back to the galaxy after a machinery malfunction sends anti love throughout the cosmos. <laughs> Along the way, you have to rescue your fellow lovers who have become trapped by the anti love robots. As you traverse a universe full of white dwarves, suns, wormholes and anti-love infected constellations that come to life. This game has a real positive feel to it. It has great energy. Yeah, well, you know what they say, fight hate with love. Negative. You'll never win with that attitude. You need to fight hate with upgradable weaponry. <laughs> Not to mention an upgradable spaceship. Well, affirmative. Throughout the game, you can upgrade your cannons, shield and engines with various gems that you'll find on each map, like power gems, metal gems and beam gems. Then, as you progress through the campaigns and rank up, your ship takes on the capability for multiple gem sockets, meaning you can mix and match the gems to create different combos to really get your firepower firing. Pew pew! Pew pew! Pew pew! Yeah, well, things can get a bit frantic at times. Yes, but as the saying goes, together we can achieve anything. That's not the saying. The saying is, with powered up beam missiles, a metallic shield and the reflexes of a cat, you can achieve anything. This game is a lot of fun, and thanks to randomised maps, each time you play a level, you'll get a different experience. Yeah, it does provide a lot of replayability. It's a challenging game, with the monsters coming in swarms at times, but above all, it's ridiculously fun. Oh, totally. From the art style to the sound effects, to the music and the character design, they all fit so perfectly in the stylized universe of what I'm going to say are uh, bunnies. <laughs> Love bunnies? I mean, they're all kinds of cute little creatures. 
Now, the controls might seem a bit daunting at first, particularly in single player mode, controlling not only yourself, but your companion as well. But it doesn't take long to get a grip on the time-slowing pet command mechanic that enables you to direct your pet around your neon spaceship of love. And that cat really does have incredible aim. Mm, but that's just the single player. In the co-op, the cat is replaced with a friend. <gasps> Hex, could I be that friend? I think you could, Bajo. Oh, oh, there's so ca many. I can't hit, the oh. yellow, hit the yellow button, Hex. Uh. Hit the yellow one. Uh. It'll clear the screen. This thing? Yeah. Smash it. Yeah. You know what, guys? I think I love this game. I love it too. What? is love. Uh, Hex, what's your final score? Uh, I'm giving it four out of five rubber chickens. Yeah, I'm giving it four out of five rubber chickens as well. What a great title, too. Ah, uh, lasers love. Yes, Darren. Oh, well, that's okay then. Uh, now it's time for another round of amazing strategies with Goose and me. Roll the tape, Carrie. <laughs> Attention, Goose! Oh, oh Darren! Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> Why on earth are you wearing those ridiculous sun spectacles? Oh, these? Um, well, Darren, I was just preparing for today's strategy in Plants vs. Zombies, sunflower stacking. Ah, what a bright idea, Goose! Ah, good one, Darren. <laughs> uh, as sunshine is the main currency in the game, a garden full of happy, smiling sunflowers is crucial if you want to afford enough plants to keep the zombies at bay. And by making them your priority early on, you shouldn't have to worry about collecting up enough later when things can start to get out of control. Indeed, Darren. Now, while this strategy is most useful in the original game, learning to manage and maximise your resources is an incredibly useful skill for many other games too. To begin, quickly snatch the first few natural glimmers you can to start purchasing a full row of single-headed sunflowers. Now, make sure, of course, to plant them as far away from the encroaching zombies as possible. Remember that you will usually have some time before needing to place an offensive plant, so stick to sunflowers for as long as possible. Once a zombie does begin to advance, pop a pea shooter in the third row away. That way you'll be able to fit two whole rows of sunflowers in and maximise your rays. Continue this strategy until you have close to two whole rows. While in the meantime, keep saving up for the all-important double sunflower. Once you're able to afford one, replace a single sunflower from your first row with a double sunflower. Then just repeat until your first row is full of double smiling faces. You'll start outputting so much sunshine, you won't know what to do with it. Remember, if it's a particularly difficult stage, you can always dig up the second row and replace them with offensive plants, as your first row is essentially doing all the work. What a terrific strategy for managing resources, Darren. You could say we shone some light on the subject. Oh, you <laughs> certainly do shine in this area, Goose. <laughs> How illuminating. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played indeed. <laughs> uh, don't touch the moustache. Oh, sorry. I just had it waxed. No, oh, very good. It looks lovely. Oh, thank you, sir. No, thank you, sir. Uh, a very worthy strategy, Darren. Ah, oh, indeed. But tally-ho, no time to waste. It's now time for you two to go answer some questions at the Ask Spawn Point desk. Pip-pip! All right, well, let's start off this week with something a little bit different because I thought we might do a little bit of show and tell. Uh, we got sent these lovely drawings in from Jane in Toowoomba, Queensland. We got the whole Mario gang going on here, pretty much. Mario? Nice work there, Jane. Toad. Oh, there's some excellent shading and colouring skills on display here. Did it come with a question, Hex? Uh, nope, nope, just these awesome drawings. So thanks so much for that, Jane. Uh, but let's keep the show and tell theme going a little bit with this one from Ethan, King of Cat Playland, who is in Minecraft, New South Wales. Uh. I love making loot traps and seeing new mods in Minecraft. Can you show me some of your favourite mods and loot traps? P.S. Do you like my roller coaster and underwater house? P.S. Darren is a noob. P.P.S. Bajo, do these. Squeeze a hash here. The side brackets. 
Well, Ethan, to be honest, we haven't actually played with that many loot trap designs. The only one we ever made was our giant tower. Ah, uh, yes, and after we built that one years ago, we never really needed another one, so we haven't looked around that much. But it does the job, and we're still pretty proud of that design. <laughs> yeah, it's basically just a tall tower of dark rooms. But the dark rooms trigger mobs to spawn in, then those mobs wander into little streams at the edge of the rooms, fall into these lava traps, and deliver their loot straight to us. <laughs> there are loads of designs for different kinds of traps out there, though. Some look ridiculously complicated with self-sorting chests and all kinds of crazy contraptions, while others are basically just giant holes in the ground. Mm. As for our favourite mods, well, to be honest, we mostly only ever played with just plain old vanilla Minecraft, but we do sometimes find the Too Many Items mod very useful, since it basically just gives you instant access to everything that exists in Minecraft. Mm. It also lets you switch your world from creative to survival or choose the time of day instantly, which can be very handy. There's also the Not Enough Items mod, which does a similar thing and a lot of people prefer that one. Mm. And if you're wondering, no, we didn't use that mod to make our world. We made all that 100% legit in survival mode with no mods way back in the day. But we will admit that these days we do sometimes use too many items just to help us get bits of footage which would otherwise take ages to get. Mm. That's about the only mod we've really spent much time with though. And there are so many mods out there it's hard to keep up with what's being created. Mm. Indeed. Personally, I always like me some graphics hex, and Minecraft can often be a bit plain for my taste, mm. which is a style, which is fine, but sometimes, you know, I just want something that can make it look and run a bit better. Mm. So Shaders Mod and Optifine will both make the game look way better and run smoother, especially on weaker computers. Mm. I always like the look of anything that adds something new or interesting to the experience. Things like dinosaurs or Pokemon or even space travel, for example. How oh. cool is that? Also, anything which is just wacky fun, like TNT mods that let you <laughs> explode Darren's statue in new and exciting ways. They always seem worth a try. <laughs> Indeed. As for your underwater house and roller coaster, well, they are very cool. We built our own underwater area and I know how much of a pain building underwater can be, so good work with that. But let's move on to this one now from Sabawitha, who is in Glendening, New South Wales. I wish I could have that too many items mod in real life. Yeah? Yeah, I'd just make a person appear to make me a cheese sandwich. Why wouldn't you just have cheese sandwiches spawn automatically into your world? <laughs> eh? <laughs> eh? Ideas, girl. Right here. Thinking two steps ahead. <laughs> In Star Fox 64, when you barrel roll, you're actually doing a aileron roll. And when you do a somersault, it takes three seconds to do it. 1.5 to go up and 1.5 to go up. This means that they do a circle and when you somersault in battle, you must do what's called a tactical egg. They don't. Therefore, the people who made this game are noobs and need to take a sip from the noob cup Supper with the owl. Oh, oh. Oh, Nintendo's in trouble. Better get Darren on the line, Hex, and then we can send him over to Japan with the noob cup. Quick smart. Hello. Hey. Hi, it's Hex. And Barjo here. We've got a letter from a spawning which says the people who made Star Fox are noobs. Total noobs. Apparently in the game you can do an aileron roll, not a barrel roll, and they got their somersaults wrong too. That's certainly some impressive knowledge of aerial combat manoeuvres and a keen attention to detail you have there. In Star Fox, you do indeed perform an aileron roll rather than a barrel roll. Barrel rolls involve performing a wide roll in a barrel-shaped motion, while aileron rolls roll on a very narrow and straight trajectory. Ah, so they did get it wrong. Oh, looks like you're going to Japan, Darren. Get that noob cup ready. Uh, not so fast, Bajo. It's interesting the Spawnling has pulled them up on those technicalities when the rest of the game involves such improbable and unrealistic depictions of things like talking animals flying spaceships against a giant floating head. Oh, yeah, I guess they weren't really going for a particularly gritty or realistic vibe with the Star Fox games, were they, Darren? Negative. And not every game needs to strictly abide by the rules of reality. We have to allow for creative freedom or we'd only ever have simulator games, which would get quite tedious. But still, surely they can't just call something a barrel roll when it's not. Well, it's worth noting that they are flying spaceships which are either in space or on planets we don't know the gravity of. So many rules of dogfighting that apply on Earth, like the tactical egg, don't necessarily have to apply in the universe of Star Fox. And in their universe, they may simply refer to aileron rolls as barrel rolls, for all we know. Well, I guess that's a fair point. A plus? 
Star Fox was created by one of the most creative and influential men in video game history, Shigeru Miyamoto, who some sportlings will know also created Mario, one of gaming's most iconic and long-running characters. So I don't think it would be appropriate to classify him as a noob and demand that he drink from the noob cup. Oh, yeah, I mean, he's basically responsible for introducing millions of people to gaming and curing their noobishness. He's like the anti-noob. Affirmative. He's almost as ruthless at exterminating noobs as I am. All right, well, I guess Shiggy is safe for now then. Thanks, Darren. Oh, my pleasure. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. All right, well, next up, let's go with this one from Queensland, though I am a boy who is in Queensland, which is in Queensland. <laughs> I heard that there is a Minecraft story mode on Wii U. Is this true? Also, why can't you review M-rated games? Can you review some M games that you think are suitable for us? Also, try to program Darren to not be a noob. <laughs> you are the best! Queensland. Well, Queensland, we are happy to say that, yes, Minecraft Story Mode is coming to Wii U, which will actually be the first time any form of Minecraft has been released on a Nintendo console. And it will be coming out on pretty much everything else too, including almost every console, PC, Mac and mobile, although it won't be available for the original Wii or 3DS. The first episode is coming out soon too, and it'll be available at the end of the month, so be sure to keep an eye out for our review of it around then. But as for why we can't review games rated higher than PG, well, that's because we're an ABC3 TV show, and ABC3 is a network made especially for you spawnlings. Mm. Yeah, so it's a channel that grown-ups can feel safe about their spawnlings watching. As for maybe looking at M games that we think are appropriate, well, it's not really our place to say. That's actually a decision for your grown-ups. Yeah, I mean, we do sometimes look at games that have haven't been classified though, and in those instances we do our best to look thoroughly at the game and make sure it hasn't got anything inappropriate in it. And sometimes we will briefly show bits of higher rated games if we need to when we refer to them in, say, a news story. But we'll only ever show parts of those games that are safe for all ages to watch. Mm. If you are interested in an M rated game that you think might be suitable for you, then it's best to have a chat with your grown-ups about it and see what they think. We also review mature games on our big show, Good Game, but once again make sure sure that you check with your grown-ups if you want to watch that show. But on that note, we're actually out of time for this week, so if you'd like to ask us something, then you can go here and send it in. <laughs> Heck, something's nibbling at my foot. What is that? I don't know. It's... Ah! Ah! Oh, what is that? Ah! 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 OK, guys, let's start our engines and take a look at Forza Motorsport 6. Vroom, vroom, vroom! isn't to be confused with the Forza Horizon spin-off series, where the Horizon games offer big open worlds to mess around in, the main Forza games are serious simulation races. But Forza has always been a great on-ramp into the world of simulated races. It's realistic racing but has loads of assists and difficulty options. This can make it forgiving enough for even the most novice driver to feel like a racing superstar. Oh, definitely. Without the help of that trusty driving line and that oh-so-handy rewind button, I'd struggle to wrangle most of these beastly cars across the finish line. And there is quite the selection of beastly cars available for wrangling, with over 400 in the game, covering almost every kind of car in existence. Uh, but the Forza games have always had an excellent selection of cars. What they haven't had until now, though, is rain and night racing. Yes, night racing can be terrifying. <laughs> Especially when there are no lights on the track other than your headlights and you're flying up to corners at hundreds of kilometres per hour. But the only thing scarier than nighttime racing is the rain. Oh, hex, those puddles mean business. Oh, man, hitting a puddle can be serious disaster or at least result in a lot of spinning. Affirmative. This can be caused by a phenomenon known as hydroplaning where if a car hits a puddle at high speed, the wheels actually stay on top of a layer of water, removing almost all contact with the road. And you really have to change up your driving line to be able to avoid those puddles, which I like. Hex, how pretty is the rain? It's really beautiful, isn't it? 
The way the raindrops roll around on your windscreen is especially impressive. I was a little disappointed that the weather and time of day wasn't dynamic, though. So it never goes from a sunny day to a rainy one, or from day to night, and there's no night rain. Yeah, it would have been nice to see those weather conditions change during a race, and I was a bit disappointed that there weren't more tracks with night and rain variations available. But maybe we're just being greedy. There's more variety than ever compared to previous games, and even after a full day of playing, I don't think I ever raced the same exact track in the same conditions twice. The main campaign is now known as the Stories of Motorsport. Uh, this will guide you through five different series, beginning with street races, through ever more powerful cars, until you get to ultimate racing. I was a bit worried with a setup like that, that I would be stuck in slow cars for ages, but it wasn't long before I was racing some seriously fast cars. Yeah, and I like that you can jump into showcase events whenever you want, just to mix things up. Showcase races are basically little challenges with preset cars that cover all sorts of racing from indie cars to classic racing cars or even bowling to name a few. And they are very generous with rewards and unlocks too, so you'll quickly be able to build up the garage of your dreams. Uh, while you'll earn a lot of credits from simply racing, you'll also regularly get a prize spin which gives you a chance to win lots of credits or even a very expensive car. Another new feature they've added in are mods. These are essentially packs of power-up cards that you can buy and play during a race. These can do things like put you higher up in the starting grid, give you a small performance increase, or even hinder you in some way for a chance at extra rewards. They felt a bit odd to me in a sim racer like this. They kind of felt like a Mario Kart style power-up, and it just kind of pulled me out of the realism a bit. Well, they are completely optional, so you don't have to use them. And I actually think they're a good addition to help you out if there's a race that you're struggling with, or even to give yourself an extra challenge if you feel up for it. I was impressed with the game's level of artificial intelligence, uh, thanks to the return of the driver tar feature. Uh, and now, with 24 cars on the track, races are always very scrappy and unpredictable. <laughs> the AI will often crash or try to sideswipe you, just like a real human would. <laughs> it does make for some very exciting races. Yeah, but guys, the multiplayer is great too, and Split Screen is back. How good is that? But we should wrap this up, guys. Final thoughts? Well, I think this is the best the main series of Forza has ever been. So I'm giving it four and a half out of five rubber chickens. I'm giving it four rubber chickens. Vroom, vroom. Well, we're just about out of time for this week, but we could not end the show without the answer to your challenge, Darren. Affirmative, Bajo. At the start of the show, I asked you this. Which classic Nintendo game recently celebrated its 30th anniversary? And the answer is... Super Mario Brothers, developed by Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka. The original Super Mario Brothers was released in Japan on the NES on September 13th, 1985. It became an instant hit and is definitely one of the greatest games ever made. <laughs> Such an icon. Thanks for that, Darren. <laughs> well, next week on the show, we test drive the new vehicle-themed Skylanders Superchargers. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> We'll take to the high seas in World of Warships. Oh, warships! Oh, I must get my Admiral's jacket dry cleaned for next week. If I am to command the winds and the weather, I must do so in style. You do look pretty spiffy in that jacket, Darren. Well, until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Bajo out. Darren out. Hex, if you had a warship, what would you call it? Oh, something cool, like, um, Sea Dragon. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. I'd call mine the Bajo's Royal with Cheese. Oh, what about you, Darren? Laser Boat. We'll be making another run. The Laser Boat promises to exterminate everyone. Oh!